pray. Father in heaven, as we open your word, we ask for the presence of your spirit. This is a very complex subject, the 70 weeks, but I ask that you will make things clear so that we can understand all of the details that we're going to study. We claim your promise of your presence in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. We have far more material to cover than I can actually do in the two presentations on the 70 weeks. If you would like a full study, you can go to our website, secretsunsealed.org, and go to our archives, and there is a 26-page document on Daniel 9. And so I would encourage you to go there for all of the details. Daniel 9 is the greatest messianic prophecy of the Old Testament for two reasons. Number one, because it not only predicts, predicts the events of Messiah's mission on earth, but it predicts the specific dates for those events. You see, there are many prophecies in the Old Testament that tell us what the Messiah was going to do. But this passage not only tells us what he was going to do, but also when he was going to do it. Now, I want to review as we begin the four stages of Israel's history, and I'll do this briefly and quickly. The first stage is Sinai to Babylon, a period of eight to 800 years. Then Babylon to John, 483 years. Then the ministry of Christ that lasts three and a half years, and after Christ's ascension till the end of the 70 weeks, you have three and a half years. Now I want to begin by reading Daniel 1 verses 1 and 2, where we find the beginning of the Babylonian captivity. Daniel 1, 1 and 2. And what I want you to notice here, this is happening in the year 605, is that before the city was destroyed, the city also lost its governance because the nobility were taken to Babylon. So it lost its civil power to rule before the city was physically destroyed. And so it says in Daniel 1, 1 and 2, in the third year, this is 605 B.C., of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. So now, Jerusalem is left without a ruler. So governance is removed first. So it says, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And by the way, he also took away the nobility. Daniel and his friends were of the noble house so that there would be no ruler. So before the city is destroyed, governance is removed. But then, of course, the city, the temple, and the walls are destroyed in the year 586. Let's read about the destruction of Jerusalem in 2 Chronicles 36 and verses 15 through 20. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his word, and scoffed at his prophets. Until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people, until there was no remedy. Therefore he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, had no compassion on young man or virgin, on the ages or, or aged or the weak. He gave them all into his hand, and all the articles from the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and of his leaders, all these he took to Babylon. Then they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, and burned all its palaces with fire, and destroyed all its precious possessions. 
And those who escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, where they became servants to him and his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. So two points that I want us to notice. Number one, the city loses its governance before the city is physically destroyed. And so if Israel is going to be restored, governance has to be restored, and the city has to be rebuilt. Now, Daniel, just two years before the 70-year captivity ended, fears that perhaps the sinfulness of Israel is so great that God is going to extend the period of 70 years. So in Daniel 9, verses 1 and 2, we find Daniel studying the prophecy of the 70 years that Jeremiah wrote about. It says in Daniel 9, 1 and 2, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the book books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So Daniel is saying, it's 938, I know that we were taken captive in 605, so the captivity should end in the year 536, two years from now. But then Daniel starts thinking, he says, now wait a minute, maybe the sinfulness of Israel was so great that God is not going to fulfill his promise, and it's going to be a longer period of captivity. And so Daniel now raises a prayer to God. And he confesses the sinfulness of Israel. And he begs the Lord not to delay in fulfilling his promise of letting his people go after 70 years. I only want to read the last part of Daniel's prayer. It goes all the way from verse 3 through verse 19. But I want to read only verses 18 and 19. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. And then notice, do not what? Do not delay. For your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. Don't delay to fulfill that after 70 years you're going to let your people go. So then, Gabriel comes to Daniel. And he tells Daniel, Daniel, the 70 years will end. And your people will return to the land. And God is going to give them a 70-week probation. Notice Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24, what it says about this period of 70 weeks. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. And then six things are going to happen during the period of the 70 weeks, particularly at the end, during the last week, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So Gabriel tells him, Daniel, God will fulfill his promise. Your people will return to their land, will return to their city, Governance will be reestablished. The city and the walls will be rebuilt. The sanctuary, the religious system will begin to function again. And 70 weeks are given as a grace period for your nation. Now, of course, the big question is, when do the 70 weeks begin? Well, in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25, we have the secret of when the 70 weeks were going to begin. It says there in Daniel 9.25, Know therefore and understand 
that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, by the way, those two words, I don't have the time to get into it, but restore is not the same as build. Restore means to establish governance again and the religious system. Build means to build the physical city. See, both things were removed, both things need to be restored. So it says, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, which means the anointed one, the prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. In other words, there's going to be 69 weeks between the decree and the appearance of the anointed one or the Messiah. Now, once again, I want to underline that there are two things that need to be reestablished. Governance and the physical city. Now, there are four possible dates for the beginning of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. One of them was given by Cyrus in the year 536, the year when they were released from captivity. That cannot be the decree to restore and build Jerusalem because the decree of Cyrus only gave them permission to rebuild the temple. You can find that in the book of Ezra. Then in the year 520, 16 years later, Darius the Persian gave a decree restoring the decree that was given in 536 because it had been suspended. Once again, the decree by Darius the Persian was only to rebuild the temple. That was in the year 520. Then you have a decree by Artaxerxes in 457 BC. That is the decree that restores and builds Jerusalem. By the way, there was one more decree by Artaxerxes in the year 444 BC. That one won't work either because that was only permission to go and rebuild the wall. So there's only one decree that fits. The first two had to do with the building of the temple. The last one had to do with building of the walls. There's only one in Ezra 7 that fulfills the command to restore and to build Jerusalem. Ezra 7 verse 13 refers to that decree. Here, King Artaxerxes states, I issue a decree that all those of the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites in my realm who volunteer to go up to Jerusalem may go with you. And then it speaks about the rebuilding of the temple and the city and restoring their civil order. You can read in the following verses. Now the question is, when did Artaxerxes give this decree to restore and build Jerusalem, to restore their civil and religious order and to rebuild the city and the walls? Ezra 7 verse 7 gives us the date. It says, some of the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the Nethinim came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. So we now, when the decree is given, it is given the seventh year of Artaxerxes. And you ask the question, what was the seventh year of King Artaxerxes? Well, two great scholars several years ago, wrote a book called The Chronology of Ezra 7. Their names, Siegfried Horn, who was, is the dean of Seventh-day Adventist archaeologists, he passed away a few years ago, and Kenneth Wood, who was editor of the Review and Herald for quite a long period of time. They showed in that book, by examining archaeology, history, and astronomy, that there's no doubt that the decree of Artaxerxes was given in the fall of the year 457 BC. So in other words, the 70 weeks begin in 457 BC. We know what the starting date is. Now, we need to understand that the 70 weeks are not weeks of days. They are weeks of years. In prophecy, days are equivalent to years. So 70 weeks times 7 days each week comes out to 490 years. 
In other words, from 457 BC forward, the 70 weeks were going to last 490 years. Are we on the same page? Now, the 70 weeks are divided into three segments. They're divided into seven weeks. After the seven weeks, 62 weeks, and then the final week. Let's read Daniel 9, verse 25, and then we'll go to verse 27. It says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be, what? Seven weeks. That's the first segment. And then what? And 62 weeks. So the first two segments are seven weeks and then 62 weeks. And then in verse 27, it says, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for what? For one week. That's the last week. For one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. So there's three segments to the 70 weeks, three divisions. Seven weeks, 62 weeks, and one final week. Now, why do you have seven weeks? Seven weeks is equal to 49 years. Last I knew seven times seven is 49. So the first seven, seven weeks have to do with the rebuilding and restoring of Jerusalem. You can read this in Daniel 9, verse 25. It speaks about these, these uh, seven weeks, these 49 years after uh, the, the, the decree is given. It says, the street shall be rebuilt again and the wall even in troublous times. So the seven years, 49 years after 457 deals with the rebuilding of the city and the reestablishment of their civil and religious order. But then you have 62 weeks that go beyond that. The seven plus the 62 take us to the Messiah, to the anointed one. In other words, 69 weeks from 457 BC will take you to the moment when the Messiah is anointed, when the Messiah appears. How many years is that? Seven weeks plus 62 weeks is 69 weeks times seven days each week is 483 years. This is simple math. It's not geometry or algebra or trigonometry or calculus. We should be able to grasp this quite easily. Now let's go once again to Daniel 9 and verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. I want to repeat once again that the word Messiah, the word Messiah means the anointed one. The equivalent Greek word is Christ. The word Christ means anointed. By the way, that's where we get the word christened from. A christening is an anointing, right? And the first part of christening is Christ. So the word Messiah or Christ means the anointed one. So from the time that the decree is given until the anointed one, there would be 69 weeks. Now the question is, when did Messiah appear and when was the Messiah anointed? Let's go to Luke chapter 3 and verses 1 to 3. Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. This passage gives us several historical events to let us know when the Messiah was anointed. It says, Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea and the region of Traconitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. I would say that we have a lot of historical markers here, wouldn't you? Now the question is, what is the date? We'll come back to that. 
It says here, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, that's John the Baptist, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now the question is, when did this take place? Well, we know that Tiberius Caesar began his reign in the year 12 A.D. 12 A.D. But this happened in the 15th year of his reign. So you add 12 plus 15, and it takes us to what date? It takes us to the year 27 A.D. In other words, the year 27 A.D. was going to be the year in which Messiah would appear. The anointed one, or the Christ, was going to appear. Now let's go to Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. We just noticed that John is going out preaching in the year 27. And while he's preaching, somebody shows up to where he's preaching. Jesus. It says here in Mark 1, 9 through 11, it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the seven heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. What date was Jesus baptized? He was baptized by John the Baptist in the year 27 A.D. Now let's go to Luke 4, 18 and 19. This is right after the baptism of Jesus. Luke 4, 18 and 19. Jesus goes to the synagogue in Nazareth. And he, uh, he opens the book. He's, he's asked to give the scripture reading for the worship service. And he opens up the scriptures to a passage in Isaiah 61. It says there in verses 18 and 19, Jesus is speaking, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. When did the Spirit come upon Jesus? When he was baptized, right? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed. What? He is what? Oh, so when was Jesus anointed? When he was baptized in the year 27. And because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So when Jesus was baptized, he was anointed for his mission. Now, lest you doubt, let's go to Acts chapter 10, verses 36 to 38. Acts chapter 10 36 to 38. Scripture interprets Scripture. The Bible explains itself. Everything that we need to understand the Bible is in the Bible. Acts 10, verse 36. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, He is Lord of all. That word, you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, Now notice here comes the key portion. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. When did Jesus receive the Holy Spirit? At his baptism. And this speaks of his baptism as his anointing. So to Messiah, to the time of the anointed one, 69 weeks. And Jesus was anointed in the year 27 A.D. By the way, shortly after his baptism, Jesus spoke some very interesting words. Mark 1, verses 13 and 14. Mark 1, 13 and 14. This is right after his baptism. Now he's beginning his ministry. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. What did Jesus mean when he said he begins his ministry? The time is fulfilled. What time is he referring to? 
the time of the prophecy of the 70 weeks. He has just been baptized. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Now let's go to one last text about the anointing of the Messiah. John 1, we'll read verse 32, and then we'll go down to verse 41. Jesus is baptized, and then something very interesting happens. It says there in verse 32, And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. Then immediately after his baptism, in verse 41, Andrew finds his brother Simon. And he says something very interesting to Simon right after the baptism of Jesus. He says, we have found the Messiah. Are you catching all these texts? The significance? We have found the anointed one right after his baptism which is translated into Greek, the Christ. So when was Jesus anointed? At his baptism. In what year? 27 AD, 483 years after the command was given to restore and build Jerusalem. Now what season of the year was Jesus baptized? He was baptized in the fall of the year 27. You say, how do you know that? It's very simple. What season of the year was Jesus crucified? In the spring. Because he was crucified at Passover. And Passover was in March, April. In the spring. How long did the ministry of Jesus last? Three and a half years. So you go from the fall of 27 to the fall of 28, to the fall of 29, to the fall of 30, to the spring of 31. How many years? Three and a half years. He was baptized in the fall of the year 27, and he was crucified in the spring of the year 31. Now something was going to happen in the middle of the last week. We already noticed that the Messiah would come at the beginning of the last week. Now let's notice what was going to happen in the middle of the last week. Daniel 9, verse 26. And I don't have time to deal with structural matters of Daniel 9. In the material, if you go to our website, there's a whole structural study because things seem to go back and forth here in the prophecy of the 70 weeks. It appears to not be in order, but it is in order if you know how it's structured. But anyway, Daniel 9, verse 26 says, and after the 62 weeks, sometime after the 62 weeks and the seven weeks, because the seven weeks are the first part, the 62 weeks are the next part. So at some point during the last 62 weeks, Messiah would be cut off. The anointed one would be cut off, but not for himself. Now what does that mean? Messiah would be cut off, not for himself. Well, we have to go to other places in the Bible to find out what it means. Isaiah 53, verse 5. Isaiah 53, verse 5. Who, was Jesus, who did Jesus die for? Did he die for himself? No. Isaiah 53, verse 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. So he was cut off not for himself. What does cut off mean? Isaiah 53 verse 8. It says, he was taken, speaking about Jesus the Messiah, he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. What does the cutting of, off of Messiah mean? It means that he was going to be killed but he would die not for himself. Is that true of Jesus? Absolutely. Now, there's something very interesting. There is a link between the death of the Messiah and another destruction of Jerusalem. You see, this prophecy tells us that at the end of the 70 weeks, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed again like it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And it will be destroyed because they rejected the Messiah. 
You say, is that in the prophecy of the 70 weeks? Yes, it is. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26, and we'll read the last part of the verse. After saying, we just read, that Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself, then it speaks about the destruction of Jerusalem. It says, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Was Jerusalem going to be destroyed again and the sanctuary going to be destroyed again? Yes. Does it have anything to do with the cutting off of the Messiah? Yes. So it says, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Matthew 24 speaks about when you see the abomination of desolation. We'll come back to that. Now there were further events during the last week. Not only was the Messiah going to be cut off, but Daniel chapter 9 gives us the specific point in the last week when he was going to be cut off. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27 says, and he, that is the prince who shall come, that we read about in the previous verse, we'll come back to that, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Which week is that? It's the last week, right? We're dealing with the last week. So what is the prince that who is to come going to do? He is going to confirm the covenant during what? During the last week. And he's going to confirm it with what? Many for the last week. Now there's something very interesting. And that is in the book of Daniel when the word prince is used, it always refers to Jesus unless it's dealing with a secular prince. The word prince refers here to Jesus. He will confirm the covenant with many. Now let's notice in the New Testament the fulfillment of this. Daniel or Matthew chapter 26, verses 27 and 28. Matthew 26, 27 and 28. This is when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. Remember the key words are covenant and many, right? Those are the key words. The last week he will confirm the covenant with many. In Matthew 26, 27 and 28, it says he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The two key words. Notice Mark chapter 10 and verse 45. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Once again. Isaiah 53, verse 11 you know, you would have to be awful fast with your fingers to find these texts. But, uh, you know, I just want you to catch the picture. If you're writing down the text, you'll be able to look at them later. Isaiah 53, verse 11, this remarkable messianic prophecy says, Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul the word soul means life. He poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with transgressors and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for transgressors. Now here's something interesting. The word covenant, when it is used in the book of Daniel, it always refers to God's covenant. It never refers to a secular covenant. And the reason I say this is important is because Futurists believe that the prince that who is to come is a Roman prince that will establish a ten-nation generation, uh, a ten-nation federation at the end of time, and he will be the prince that will come, and he will fulfill this prophecy. But I'm going to show you that the prince who is to come is not some prince who will arise after the rapture of the church and then reestablish a ten-nation Roman federation, and persecute the Jews, the prince who is to come here is none other than Jesus Christ. And the covenant is not some secular covenant of this individual in the future with the literal Jewish nation. The covenant here is God's covenant that he ratifies with his people when he comes to this earth the first time. Now there's another thing that's going to happen during the last week. Now we're going to see when the Messiah is cut off. 
Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. That's the last week, week number seven. By the way, would he confirm the covenant with literal Israel during that week? Of course he would have to. Because the 70 weeks were determined for whom? The 70 weeks were for Israel. So that last week, what he's doing, he's doing specifically in Israel. He's doing it for Israel. He's sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel until the year 34, when the 70 weeks come to an end. So it says, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, ah, in the middle of the last week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. So when was Messiah going to be cut off? In the middle of the last week. Now here's something very interesting. Notice Mark 15, 38 and 39. Mark 15, 38 and 39. Jesus is on the cross. And he's about to die. In fact, he's going to breathe his last. And when he breathes his last, something happens. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. There was a massive veil in the temple. And something very interesting happened at that very moment. Ellen White wrote in Desire of Ages, page 757, a very remarkable statement. You see, the prophecy says that in the middle of the week, he would cause the sacrifice and the offering to cease. The sacrifice and offering would cease at that moment. That was literally fulfilled. Desire of Ages 757. Listen to this remarkable statement. This is when the veil is ripped from top to bottom. All is terror and confusion. The priest is about to slay the victim because it's three o'clock in the afternoon, the, the hour of the evening sacrifice. But the knife drops from his nerveless hand and the lamb escapes. No lamb died that day. The lamb escapes. Type has met antitype. In other words, the fulfillment is here. That day the lamb did not die because the lamb of God who takes the sin away from the world is the one who died. Literally, the sacrifice and oblation ceased. She continues writing, the great sacrifice had been made. The way into the holiness, holiest is laid open. A new and living way is prepared for all. No longer need sinful, sorrowing humanity await for the coming of the high priest. Henceforth, the Savior was to officiate as a priest and advocate in the heaven of heavens. It was, now notice her terminology, it was as if a living voice had spoken to the worshipers. There is now an end to all sacrifices and offerings. Wow! Literally fulfilled. The sacrifice and the offering ceased. Of course, the very next day, they started all over again. But with no significance whatsoever. Hebrews 7, 26 and 27 tells us, For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Are you understanding this prophecy? It's a remarkable prophecy. Not only does it describe the events, but it describes the specific timing for those events. Now you say, now wait a minute, Pastor, you said uh, that the people of the prince shall come and shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who, are the, who is the prince? Who are the people of the prince? Well, I'll tell you up front. The people of the prince are the Jews. And the prince is Jesus. You say, now wait a minute. That can't be true. Because the Jews did not destroy Jerusalem. It says the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city. It says here the people are going to destroy the city. The people of the prince are going to destroy the city. And the sanctuary. So the, and so the question is, did the Jews destroy the city? 
Well, let me first of all deal with the word prince. As I mentioned before, the word prince in Daniel, when it's used in a religious context, always means Jesus. He's called in Daniel 9.25, Messiah the prince. In Daniel 8, 11, and 12, he's called the prince of the host. In Daniel 11.22, he's called the prince of the covenant. And in Daniel 12, verse 1, he's called Michael the great prince. The word prince always applies to Jesus, so it must apply to Jesus in this verse as well. I want to read from Joshua 5, verses 13 through 15. This is right when Jericho is going to be destroyed. And Joshua is on the outskirts of the city, and a, and a majestic being appears to him. And Joshua sees this warrior with his sword in his hand and asks him who he is. Let's read Joshua 5, 13 through 15. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, No, but as commander, and actually the King James says, Prince, the same word as in Daniel, the prince of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Who was this prince of the army of the Lord? Oh, there's no doubt who it is, because it says here, and Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army or the Lord's host said to Joshua, take your sandal off your foot for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Who is the prince of the host? He is God. Because Joshua calls him Lord. Because Joshua bows and worships. And because the, this prince of the host commands him to take his shoes off his feet. Because where he stands is holy. So who is this prince that, that, that is going to come? It's Jesus. The people are the Jews. Now let's look at the expression, the prince of who is to come. That expression, who is to come, is very important. Let's go to Psalm 118. We'll read verse 22 and 23, and then we'll go to verse 26. Psalm 118, verse 22, and then verse 26. Jesus here is prophetically speaking about himself. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone He's speaking about himself, isn't he? He's the stone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Daniel says the prince who is to come. Here it says that Jesus was the stone that the builders rejected. And it says blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus quoted this verse. In Matthew 21, verse 42, at the conclusion of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, Matthew 21, verse 42 says, Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. He's quoting this verse from the Psalms. And when Jesus was entering triumphantly into Jerusalem on what Christians call Palm Sunday, I want you to notice what the people sang. They sang Psalm 118. Matthew 21 verse 9 says, Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Who is the prince who is to come? Jesus is the prince who is to come when you look at the phrases. And then Jesus goes on to say that the kingdom will be taken from the Jews and given to a nation that produces the fruits thereof in Matthew 21. 
Verse 43, he says, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And in Luke 19, in the parallel passage, after the people sing, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And after Jesus says, I am the stone that the builders rejected. Then Jesus goes on to speak about the kingdom being given to the Gentiles. And he refers to the destruction of Jerusalem. Notice Luke 19, 37 to 44. Does the killing of the Messiah have anything to do with the destruction of Jerusalem? It does. Twice we find in this prophecy that there's a link between the Jewish nation slaying the Messiah and the result, the destruction of Jerusalem. Notice Luke 19. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you especially, in this your day, the things that make for your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come. Notice he's speaking about his rejecting, the stone that the builders rejected. He's, they, they sing, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus says the kingdom is going to be taken from you, and it's going to be given to the Gentiles. And then Jesus speaks about the destruction of Jerusalem because of his rejection, of their rejection of him. So he says in verse 43, For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another. Is this speaking about the destruction of Jerusalem? Yes or no? Absolutely. Why was Jerusalem destroyed? Daniel says he'll be cut off and then the city is destroyed. Here it says, Jesus says, the city is going to be destroyed. And then at the end of the verse, he says, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Are you with me? Now we still have to resolve the issue of how it is that the people of the prince who is to come destroyed Jerusalem. How is that possible that the prince, the people of the prince, destroyed Jerusalem? Well, who destroyed Jerusalem in the year 70? It depends how you look at it. Did the Jews destroy their own city? Did they bring destruction on their own city? How? By rejecting the Messiah. Did God destroy the city? Yes, he did, because in the parable in Matthew 22, 7 and 8, it says that after they rejected the message, after, the, after Christ was sacrificed, it said that the king got mad and he, destroyed, he burnt their city and destroyed those murderers. So God did it. Did the Romans do it? <laughs> did the Romans do it? So who did it? <laughs> The people, by their apostasy, led God to use the Romans to destroy the city. But technically, the people of the prince destroyed the city. Are you with me or not? Let me read you a statement from Ellen White. I never cease to marvel at the simplicity of Ellen White. She always gets it right. These days, she's used very little in the church. They say, we go by the Bible. Untrue, not even by the Bible. I marvel every time I read the writings of Ellen White, I'll tell you, my mouth is open when I read her writings with the depth, the profound theological depth. Great Controversy 35 and 36. She's speaking about the destruction of Jerusalem. The Jews had forged their own fetters, they had filled for themselves the cup of vengeance. In the utter destruction that befell them as a nation and in all the woes that followed them in their dispersion, they were but reaping the harvest which their own hands had sown, says the prophet, 
O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself. He's, she's quoting from Scripture. For thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Their sufferings are often represented as a punishment visited upon them by the direct decree of God. It is thus that the great deceiver seeks to conceal his own work. By stubborn rejection of divine love and mercy, the Jews had caused the protection of God to be withdrawn from them, and Satan was permitted to rule them according to his will. By the way, the same th thing happened with Jerusalem when it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament. Who destroyed Jerusalem in the Old Testament? Was it Nebuchadnezzar? Yes. Was it God? Yes. Was it the Jews? Yes. You see, they had filled the cup. It says in, in the prophecy, it says that until there was no remedy, they could not be healed. And so because there was no remedy, the cup was full. God says, I will use my servant. By the way, God calls Nebuchadnezzar his servant. I will use my servant Nebuchadnezzar to destroy Jerusalem and take away governance because of the sin of the people. So what does it mean when it says the people of the prince that shall come will destroy the city? Is that prince a Roman prince that's going to rise after the rapture of the church in the Middle East and is going to sign a peace treaty, a covenant with Israel? And he's going to establish a ten-nation federation and during the first three and a half years he's going to keep his covenant with the Jews and then after the first three and a half years he's going to break his covenant with the Jews and he's going to bring a terrible tribulation upon them. He's going to persecute them and that's the time of trouble for the Jews. But the church is enjoying the bliss of heaven. False prophecy. It's a very serious thing to take a prophecy that centers in Messiah and attribute it to the Antichrist. It's blasphemy to say that this prince is the Antichrist instead of realizing that it is the Christ. And the reason why the city was destroyed is because they did not know the hour of their visitation. The center of this prophecy is not Antichrist. The center of the last week is not Antichrist. The center of this prophecy from beginning to end is Jesus Christ. Did you understand this prophecy? I'm amazed I was, be able to I was able to cover as much as I did. I tried to explain it the best I could. It's a complex prophecy with many elements. Now, we still have to speak about the last three and a half years. See, that's our next subject tomorrow. Don't miss the next exciting episode. Tomorrow in our first presentation, we're going to show, listen carefully, when you read Daniel 9, it appears to give us no concluding event for the 70 weeks. We assume that after Messiah is cut off in the middle of the week, there has to be three and a half more weeks because there's 70 weeks. But Daniel 9 doesn't appear to give us an event that concludes the 70 weeks. So you say, what, how do we know that the stoning of Stephen closed the prophecy of the 70 weeks? How do we know that? Is it just an assumption by Adventists? Well, you know, uh, they stoned Stephen and that closed the theocracy. Listen, folks, tomorrow I'm going to show you ironclad evidence from Scripture that the stoning of Stephen was the event that closed the prophecy of the 70 weeks. In the year 34 AD, specifically in the fall of the year 34 AD. So this is a magnificent prophecy. It gives us the starting point, 457 BC. The first seven weeks, Jerusalem is rebuilt and restored. Then, 62 weeks later, after the first seven weeks, the Messiah is anointed. Jesus is baptized. Then, 
He confirms the covenant with the Jews because he was sent to them because the 70 weeks were given for them. He confirms the covenant with many for that last week. And in the middle of the week, he causes the sacrifice and the offering to cease because there was no sacrifice or offering that day because the true Lamb of God died. And then you have the concluding part of this prophecy, which is the close of the 70 week, weeks, the stoning of Stephen. A watershed event we're going to notice. Because listen carefully. The door to the Hebrew theocracy closed in the year 34. The Jewish nation would no longer be God's nation to take the gospel to the world or for the world to come to them. They, the nation of Israel failed. There were faithful people that belonged to Israel, but the nation as a theocracy failed. So God says, now I'm going to have the Gentiles go into all of the world and share the gospel with all of the world. And here's the interesting point, and we'll cover this a little more closely tomorrow. Who was present at the stoning of Stephen? Saul of Tarsus. Interesting. Saul of Tarsus. Was Saul of Tarsus converted really at the stoning of Stephen? Did he feel the pangs of conscience at the stoning of Stephen? Oh yeah, he knew that, that Stephen was right. In fact, the Bible says that the face of Stephen looked like the face of an angel. Saul knew that he was wrong and that Stephen was right, but he kicked against the pricks. So on the road to Damascus, he is knocked to the ground and Jesus speaks to him. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he says, who are you so that I know who I'm persecuting? I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And here comes the key point. At the stony of Stephen, the, the plan of God closed for the Jewish nation, but present there was the apostle that would take the gospel to the Gentiles. So the door closes for the theocracy but the person who is going to take the gospel to the Gentiles and plant the gospel all over the world is present there and is converted to the Lord. And thus, the gospel will go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people planted initially by the Apostle Paul and then spreading throughout the entire geographical region of the world. What a remarkable prophecy.